I'm the dean of the school here, um, and usually I'm better known as the icebreaker. They assign to me, and there's a couple of other deans are in the room as well, we are asked to open these events that academics and professional experts put together and somehow make people feel comfortable and relaxed and welcomed. And they say to me, before I start these things, they say, just do your spiel. And I say, what kind of a role description is that? You know, I really don't know how to do this, but um, I'm happy to be the warm-up gig here. And uh, I want to first say uh, thank you to all the students who are here. I remind myself every day when I come to class that um, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have the job if not for the students. Uh, and that's true for all the faculty and staff as well. I'm delighted that you were able to make it. This is finals week, so I don't take it for granted that you're here. Um, definitely the faculty and the staff that are here. Um, I'm privileged to work with colleagues who care about the same uh, important issues than I do and that immigration touches all of us in all our work. And I want to thank all the friends and colleagues uh, from the real world, as I sometimes refer to. This is Hogwarts here. And then there's the real world out there. Uh, well, I'm not saying that social work is in a whole world building, but we're wor we working on that. Um, leaders that are committed to uh, inclusion and social justice, I just want to really emphasize, without you as partners, we would be nowhere. We would be in our little academic ivory tower, and we wouldn't really understand the issues as, as much as we do now because you're here with us. Um, we are honored to have among us, and I want to single out a few people, just mention because they are here and they make such a difference for me and, and my colleagues. Uh, Dennis Riordan, uh, Director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services for District 1, is with us. Marianne Higgins, the Regional Administrator of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Edward Schumacher Matos of NPR, also an advisor of our Immigrant Integration Lab. Marsha Hohn of the Immigrant Learning Center. Ed Wang of the Department of Mental Health. Members of the Governor's Advisory Council on Immigrants and Refugees. Debbie Rambo, President of Catholic Charities. And I th hope that I see uh, our own uh, Executive Vice President Pat Keating, but he may be busy at this point, maybe come later. There's a host of other people I would love to introduce if I would have more time, but there's no time for that at this point. But there are some very special guests here that you will meet shortly. But to all of you, I offer our welcome and appreciation. Those of you who do not know the GSSW, I don't assume all of you would know our school, may have asked yourself, now why the School of Social Work? And what is and who is the School of Social Work? And I can I promise you, we have um, assure you that we have struggled with that question for a number of years. And after a series of retreats and conversation and soul searching, I think we somehow found our identity around some key principles. And those principles are um, transformation, which is our, our slogan for our school, uh, innovation, imagination, this is truly Jesuit Catholic principle. Uh, passion and commitment, anything, of course, because we are a university related to uh, evidence and um, reason, and definitely that we are trying to apply those principles to local and global contexts. But all these principles that I just laid out to you would be meaningless if they are not rooted in core values. And those values in social work are ultimately the well-being of people, a just, inclusive, diverse, and peaceful world community. So the issues that we address as a school, they must matter. They must matter to us, to BC, to our funders, to society. And this is why after 75 years, um, the School of Social Work is now in the 76th year, we have become a leading school in areas such as aging, global practice, social innovation, participant-directed services, and we are on our way to establish the same distinction in fields such as integrated health, trauma, veterans' issues, and vulnerable populations. But our strategic vision 
would fall short if we would not have applied our global awareness around refugees, forced migration, to the national and local context. In this regard, immigrant integration or immigrant incorporation is front and center. The good news is that Boston College, at Boston College, you don't have to convince anyone of this because it was founded in 1863 to serve and educate poor immigrants from Ireland. So it's, it's a no-brainer, and I'm really thrilled how the BC community has responded to our initiatives. Um, now, we as a school of social work, as you can imagine, we are neither a Fortune 500 company nor are we the business school. So our resources are basically two. One is, or one are, our ideas. And we are not short on ideas. Imagination is everything that counts. And secondly, next to ideas, we have people, distinguished people, that make dreams happen. But to find those people, to find the right people, you've got to be patient and dig really deep. There are at least two sorts of faculty. I'm focusing on faculty in professional school settings. There are the tenure track faculty, and they have to go through rigorous and standardized procedures until they can really fly. And in our immigrant area, we have a junior faculty, Rocio Calvo, who works on immigrant issues, but she has to follow certain things. So if I say to her, go to that conference, she's going to say to me, how is that going to pay for my tenure? And if I say it doesn't, then said, forget it. So we need to be careful how we do this with the academic, with that kind of academic group. So at the same time, it was essential for us to think about other faculty, and those we call the professors of practice. These practice experts are a little bit more flexible in what they want to do or can do, and they bring tons of experience. And they are established players in the fields that matter to us around policy issues, around practice issues. So in 2010, that was two years ago, I attended the National Immigrant Integration Conference in Boston. And one of the co-hosts uh, was um, Westy Egmont. And I knew Westy from some social gatherings. And you know he's never shy of throwing down gauntlets in front of you. So one of the things he said, and in much harsher terms as I say it now, was, you know, academia is just not at the table. You know, what are you guys doing out there? And he showed me the list of people. There were, I don't know, a thousand people there. And in fact, uh, there were very, very few academics at that conference. And so I didn't want to let him off the hook because when someone throws a challenge on me, I usually go right after it. It's like an instinct. And uh, I said to him, Westy, we're going to do something about this issue at Boston College, at the School of Social Work, but you have to partner with us. You have to be part of this initiative. And for some reason, he had time. And uh, the hiring of Westy uh, really represents a commitment, a new venture for us. We believe that as a, that as a top 10 School of Social Work in a research university, we must address this critical issue of immigrant integration. And we are committed to making immigration one of the key themes of our school. As many of you know, Westy had many leadership roles before joining BC. He served as a pastor, was the producer and host of a TV talk show, the executive director of the Greater Boston Food Bank, and the president of the International Institute of Boston. He joined us at the beginning of this year and 12 months later, he and his immigrant integration lab was the lead story in the most recent BC Chronicle, our weekly newspaper. And I want to thank our friends, Sean Smith and Jack Dunn, who really make this happen, because you need to have that kind of awareness among friends on campus that this is a really important issue. So thanks to Westy's imagination, drive, and network, we will host on March 21st with the help of Dennis Riordan, the, uh, a naturalization ceremony on this campus as part of a migration uh, symposium that is also part of the 105th anniversary of Boston College. So thank you again for being here today with us. Thank you for partnering with us. 
and I will ask Westy to come forward and say a few words. Thank you. It's great to have a good dean and uh, the kind of person who has reeled me in, taught me that it's probably not very important for me at this point to think about retirement, but to think about exhaustion. Um, so today, let me just say a word about what we're going to do. We have uh, one of the most remarkable figures in the world on migration to be our keynote speaker, uh, and I'm going to introduce the person to introduce him. We're going to, at lunch, play a little game with some of the paper you have inside of your program, just to kind of involve you and to uh, have a little interaction while lunch gets served, so it will be served at your seat. There'll be a short break after lunch to pick up some coffee and dessert in the back of the room. And then in the afternoon, uh, a panel that I think will be a very exciting opportunity to listen to community leaders. And the key word here is to listen. Uh, I, I come from a school of thought that says very often academics are busy telling you as experts uh, everything they know, but we are all in our society very weak about listening, whether it's academics or politicians. Uh, and I think it's one of, the, one of the things that we want to do very carefully as we develop the Immigrant Integration Lab is to take a posture of listening so we know what the community agencies are dealing with. I don't mean immigrant agencies. I don't mean the, you know, VACA or the Vietnamese American Civic Association. I mean, what happens at Catholic Charities? What happens at Mass General Hospital? What happens in the VA system when they start taking a look at the changing demographics? We want to be listening. And if we listen well, we can develop, I think, the right kind of research program and the right kind of responses, both in education and in terms of uh, support of the field. So that's, that's our goal, and today is a listening exercise. You're participating by your presence, and there are many of you invited specifically in this invitation-only event, because we believe it was important that you who are invested already in the subject area in some way could help to, to shape what it is that we are doing. Uh, over the last 12 years, I've had a friendship with a, a policymaker who has uh, taught me a lot. And one of the things I realize is I'm an activist and I'm more than capable of leading organizations, but immigration is a very tough technical field. And the person who has mentored me in many ways and uh, with her expertise has been Ava Malona. And Ava, we've invited the director of MIRA and the co-chair of the National Partnership for New Americans, which are the 12 state coalitions on the states highly impacted by immigrants, uh, is here to introduce our speaker. And Ava, as you come up, I should say, she's just back from Washington, where she has been hard at work on the President of the United States and on members of Congress and on the national leadership to make sure that immigrant integration is part of the new comprehensive immigration plan. Thank you, Westy, for that kind and generous introduction. Uh, before I introduce the keynote speaker, allow me to take a second to congratulate Dean Godensi and Westy for this wonderful uh, and important initiative and wish you the very best. And now I have the distinct honor to introduce uh, the keynote speaker, Dr. Dimitri Papadimitreou, who is the president and founder of the Migration Policy Institute a Washington-based think tank dedicated exclusively to the study of migration. He is also the president and the founder of Migration Policy Institute Europe, a nonprofit independent research institute in Brussels that aims to promote a better understanding of migration trends and effects in Europe. Dr. Papa Dimitreou has published more than 250 books articles and research reports on migration topics and advises senior government and political party officials in more than 20 countries, including numerous European Union member states while their whole rotating EU presidency. He is the convener of the Transatlantic Council on Migration, which is composed of senior public figures, business leaders, and public intellectuals from Europe, the United States, and Canada. 
He also convenes and co-directs the Regional Migration Study Group at MPI and Woodrow Wilson Center convened initiative that in 2013 will propose new regional and collaborative approaches to migration, competitiveness, and human capital development in the United States, Central America, and Mexico. Through his vast knowledge, his brilliant and hard-headed thinking, his energy in creating and managing efforts that inform high-level policymakers worldwide and key actors both inside and outside the government, he has shaped understanding of and approaches to immigration and immigrant integration policy more than any other individual in the field of migration in Northern America or Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor and deep personal privilege to introduce to you a distinguished international scholar, my dear friend and colleague, the one and only Dimitri Papadmitri. Good morning, everyone. Or is it afternoon? No, it's still morning. You know, the longer people talk about you, the bigger the hole that they dig for you to fall into. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm, I feel that I'm on the precipice, you know, leaning forward. Now I need to pull back a bit. And um, I thank um, the organizers. I, needless to say, Eva is uh, a force of nature, her reach goes well beyond Massachusetts and well beyond Washington. Uh, she's the person that makes the impossible possible. And, you know, the fact that Westy has worked with Eva for so long creates opportunities that I think may have been unimaginable just a few years ago. But I also wanted to say something about you, Alberta. You're taking chances by trying to identify people in any full room. You know, I learned a long time ago, at least my colleagues always tell me, that you always forget an important person. So you're a better man than I am. I will not say anything else about anyone, <laughs> except ask you a question. Why aren't you the business school? Why aren't you paying your faculty as well as the business school? <laughs> I just, I just wanted to break the ice here and create, <laughs> create a bit of a revolt in the ranks. <laughs> I also want to thank the students and the many colleagues, some of whom I've known on and off for years, and of course, the ladies and gentlemen who are also in the audience who haven't, I haven't had the privilege of, um, of meeting before. Uh, I am going to tell you what I am not going to do. Because it's important that we establish you know, some rules. Uh, I'm not going to tell faculty what it is that they should or should not do. First of all, it would be foolish of me to say that, to attempt that. Secondly, faculty knows what it wants, and it will do ultimately what it wants. If I understand, if I remember faculty having been faculty for about a decade or so, some eons ago. I'm also, and here I want to apologize in advance, I will tell you some things that you don't want to hear. I figure if I only came here to tell you things that you want to hear, you know, how great things are, you know, what an enormous, with a little push on your part, what an enormous difference you will make, you know, whether it is in the service of the country and the community, which inevitably will include service to immigrants, newcomers, their families, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I don't, my job here is not to make you feel good. My job is to put some things on the table for you to disagree with. This way you can get me excited in return. Otherwise, I'll just be talking to myself. So, um, I'll start by saying something that's, uh, and the other thing that I want to tell you is that I'm not really going to say anything that you don't already know. It may not be on top of your list, you may not fully agree with it, but somewhere inside of you, if you do anything 
more than simply looking at the headlines about immigration. You would, somewhere inside of you, you would know those things that I'm about to say. So the first thing I want to say is that context matters. It matters immensely. It is all about context. Immigration does not happen in a void, in a, void, in a vacuum. Policies are not made, you know, they don't come down to sex machina. Uh, you know, people don't just find themselves in places. Communities don't just change willingly simply because immigrants came and diversity is a necessity. It is not some sort of a value that we discovered in America or perhaps some other place and we celebrate it. I don't celebrate anything. You know, my job is to think about these issues and propose solutions. So if context matters so much, what it is that is happening around the world that affects the United States and what is happening in the United States, the economy, the broader society that affects immigration and immigrants, and how immigrants affect that society in turn, this sort of back and forth movement that basically builds community, creates a new we. This is all about creating a new we, a new identity. That's what we really have to focus on, all of us. I don't care where anyone comes from. If you're an activist, if you're a person in the street, if you're writing about the issue, if you're a social worker, if you're a think tanker, or whatever else. So I'll tell you a few things that you also know, I happen to follow them, so I can sort of put them in capsule form, um, that uh, I think affects everything. In the next many years, I can't tell you whether it's three, five, or 10, certainly it will be three to five, perhaps more than that. There will be more migration, but that more migration is not likely to come to places like ourselves. Let me put it in a provocative way. At least for the next three to five years, the age of mass migration to high income countries is going to moderate, possibly even come roughly to a halt. Let me put it a third way. Net migration to rich countries is going to be roughly at or about zero. And you know why? I'll just walk down um, some of the reasons. What is international migration composed of? What are the typical flows? In the past 25 years or so, a quarter of a century, about a third to 50% of all migration was from low income and middle income countries, but primarily low income countries, to high income countries. The Europeans, the United States, some East Asians. And of course, something that sort of looks like migration to the Gulf states. And the sort of, we can discuss when you ask me, what the heck did I mean by that? But what has been happening in the last three or four or five years has actually, or actually amounts to almost an immigration stop. Net migration to rich countries have been, has been essentially a net zero. And for obvious reasons. The economies have stalled. The reactions to immigration have increased in most countries, not every country, and you will, I hope you will allow me to paint with a broad brush, which will allow for exceptions. In other words, you know, what Switzerland does or doesn't do may or may not be what Germany does or does not do. But if you look across the high income countries, you'll roughly find yourself where it is that I have described. What is happening in the last three or four or five years is not that total migration has decreased or stalled. It actually has increased. But it has increased in terms of low-income countries to middle-income countries, in terms of intra-middle countries, and in terms of intra 
high-income countries. And I suspect that's what it is that will be seen for the foreseeable future. I don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell you what's going to happen 10 years from now, it's simply because I cannot tell you what the key variables that are responsible for this change, for this sort of like uh, equilibrium, sort of equilibrium that we have reached, I cannot predict what the key variables, how they will behave in the next three to five or 10 years. So I will see, say that in the next uh, three, five, 10 years, we're going to see more intra-high income country migration. Rich countries from rich countries or former rich countries moving to other rich countries, Spaniards. Not just to Europe, but to Europe also, Greeks, Portuguese. Patterns that we haven't seen since the 1960s, late 50s to the 60s, actually becoming dominant patterns again. But more than that, we're going to see more migration from the rich countries to the middle income countries. And I know everyone is fascinated with the BRICS. I'm not fascinated with the BRICS. If you, follow, if you follow most of the BRICS, you'll see that Brazil, the phenom, is down to growth of about 1.5%. If you look under the figures, you will see that Brazil needs to do extraordinary, difficult structural reforms before it can actually become a BRIC. But acronyms are acronyms, and when they can actually come out of the mouth well, you know, they take their own sort of life. China is important, but China is the only country on earth that will go from a very young country to a very old country, a very mature country, without having the benefit of a demographic advantage. In other words, this long period that typically takes 30, 40, 50 years, where people can enjoy the fruits of a stable population, a youth population, and it's gonna go directly from what it is today to somewhere around 2030, where it's going to have an awful lot of old people that China will have to figure out what to do with. But if you assume that China will continue to grow, not at eight, nine, 10, 11 percent, but even if it is five or six or seven percent, China will need a massive number of immigrants in order to do the same jobs that immigrants do in every country since the beginning of time, or at least since the Bible wrote that there shall always be the hearers of good and the carriers of water. They'll do the jobs that the Chinese don't want to do. Dirty little secret, in the periphery of China, neighbors, immigrants, do an awful lot of the agricultural and seasonal work, Vietnamese and others. That is going to be, to a large degree, where the action is going to be. Poor people moving on to middle income people. But instead of just the bricks, look at Mexico. Look at Turkey. Why am I picking or pointing to those two countries? These are the countries that even though they do not yet realize it, they are already not only on their way to becoming significant immigration countries, they are already significant immigration countries. It is something, in other words, that hasn't crossed that threshold of from the unconscious to the conscious. And interestingly enough, on my, in migration, change happens at historically unprecedented rates. Spain grew its immigrant population from 3% of the population to 13 or 14 percent of the population in a mere six years, from 207, 201 to 207. Ireland, from a couple of percentage pay points to 14, 15 percent in a decade. That's how fast things happen. So, to the extent that the School of Social Work here will also be training social workers for the rest of the world, 
as I suspect you will, because every high level, high quality school also thrives on foreign students for all the reasons that you know. I'm not going to stick my foot on that one. Uh, <laughs> I suspect that understanding the context of where migration is going is extremely important. And we're increasingly seeing, I know it happens at the, at the top end of steels, we're increasingly seeing migration from rich countries to middle income countries. There is sort of something funny about that because an awful lot of that migration, perhaps much most of that migration is uh, people who have gained citizenship in our country simply going back to the country of their parents. This is Indian kids, American Indian kids, going back to India for a few years to test the waters. Brazilian kids from this part of the world here, Massachusetts, going back to Brazil for the past many years. Um, Moroccan kids and kids from the rest of the southern Mediterranean who had found themselves in their second generation Spanish citizens going back to the countries of their, uh, of their parents' birth. That's extremely significant because, first of all, it creates the opportunity of change in these countries. These are the messengers, as it were, the ambassadors for significant social change. At the same time, however, these people are doubly protected. They go to the countries of their birth, of their parents' birth, fully knowing that if they don't succeed there, they always have a chance to come back home, their home. This simply complicates and makes migration much more interesting than it used to be. So now that we have a sense, or at least my sense, of what uh, migration might look like in the next three, five, ten years, perhaps until 1920, uh, 2020. Um, let me say my guess as to what I think will be happening in the United States and why. Um, the United States, you know, has an immigration policy that's an autopilot. Uh, I know that this is being recorded, so I'm going to have to be polite. <laughs> I've been told by Eva, she says, don't say anything that you wouldn't want to have quoted the next day. So uh, let me see if I can find the words <laughs> of how not to be quotable. Autopilot is a good word. Another good word is that we are the only country among all countries that has a, an immigration system that has no relationship, I'll repeat that, no relationship to what is in the best interest of the country. It's sort of driving your grandfather's 1960s um, falcon. You notice I didn't say Oldsmobile because they probably, you know, were great Oldsmobile cars in the 1960s. I didn't say, you know, whatever, you know, the car that former President Clinton drove when he came to Washington to be president and things like that. In other words, it can kill you at, at any speed and <laughs> words to that effect. So what I'm trying to say is that a country that really wants to actively manage its immigration system and derive the most benefits for itself and for its people has an absolute obligation to constantly revisit the immigration system, learn from what works and what doesn't, and change the things that do not work. Because immigration policy is essentially the government actively engaging in social engineering. Actively engaging in social engineering. It is not a mindless business which the American immigration system tends to tend toward. 
other countries that take roughly as many immigrants as we do on a per capita, capita base, sometimes more immigrants than we do, sometimes two, two and a half times the number of immigrants that we do, the proportion of immigrants that we do, actively engage in the management of the system, always evaluate the effects of the system. They have created an adaptive formula that learns from evaluation, here's where you guys come in again, that learns from evaluation, evaluating the system and uses that knowledge to change the system going forward. The United States can't even change an iota, a comma, until you have, you know, in this case, what about 11 years fight in the US Congress. The last time that we did anything significant, it took us roughly from 78 to 86. The time after that, it took us from about 88 to the end of 90. You can't run a successful immigration system in a fast changing economy by constantly saying it's values driven, family is king, employers are bad, and we can't change either the formula or the numbers because the US Congress can't agree. I would almost prefer that you go out of business than continuing to have an immigration system like the one that I've described, which also happens to be the immigration system that we have. Nor are we likely to need all the people. And here is something to which you should object, but first listen to me, hear me out. All the people that we think that we need. You know, back in the day, 2007, 2008, or back in the day, 1997, 8, 9, the then chairman of the Fed used to say, you know, few things could be better than more migration. I don't care how you get it, just bring them on. The context at that time was 4% unemployment, which is well below what it is that most economists, even at that time, even at that time, understood as full employment. All of these assumptions rest on essentially a fundamental um, understanding of an economy, how it was at that particular time. In 2012 or 2013, the economy has changed dramatically. And what about demography? Those things about demography that we thought of as destiny, maybe are not destiny after all. Let me give you some ideas in that regard. Yes, we're aging. Look at me, you know, I used to be a young man a mere two or three years ago. Those three years <laughs> have been very hard on me, as you can tell. <laughs> so, yes, we're aging, but we're also reproducing ourselves. And we're also bringing about 1.1 million immigrants every year. And we're also bringing through all of these other, you know, um, non-immigrant categories and all of these back and side doors of immigration, et cetera, et cetera, an additional six, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand additional people per year. That is an awful lot of people. We're not really suffering from not having enough people to do the work, perhaps unlike 1997, 1998, 1999. Furthermore, how many people we need in order to do the jobs that we have is very sensitive to things that we all know, which is how many people are and are not in the labor force. And you all know that. We all know that. We have very significant numbers of people, not in the tens of thousands, in the hundreds of thousands, but in the millions who are not in the labor force. We need to find a way to get them 
in the labor force. We need to find the way to create more jobs. The problem of the United States today and the years ahead is not going to be labor shortages. It is going to be job shortages. And if the only thing that we say is we need more of everything, then I submit to you we are not being responsible analysts. Which takes me back to the importance of managing actively a migration system. A migration system should not have a logic of its own. It should be part of the logic of a nation. I'll give you another datum that perhaps demonstrates the point. By the end of 2011, the GDP, of, actually earlier in 2011, the GDP of the country was where it was at 2008, before the real trouble started. And we were able to produce that with about six million fewer workers than we did in 2008. I'm going to give you another datum. As it happens in every recession, employers invest in technology. By the time we get out of a recession, we have this highly anomalous, par paradoxical phenomenon whereby you have high unemployment and high numbers of job vacancies. You're the social workers. You can figure this out. A country that doesn't invest in people, in its people, whether it's because the employers don't do it, because the United States government or the state governments or the local governments don't have the right formula, don't have the political will, don't have the money, perhaps it ought to be thinking harder about everything, including immigration. So, The world economy is changing, the American economy and society is changing. What might that mean for immigration policy and for those uh, folks that, you know, would be in the service of, again, building community through social services, education, etc.? What's likely to happen in the next few years? I think that immigration will be more selective, almost by definition. At some point, as part of the overall deal, you know, we'll have to do something about the current immigration system. I think that in making immigration more, more selective, we'll probably think, need to think harder you know, about the system of family migration that was established 45 years, whatever the math is. Yeah, uh, 1964, so 65. Legislation that was conceived in 1962, so it's about 50 years. It's going to be a hard fight, but it will have to be something that we'll have to think hard about. So if we think of this as sort of a championship match, a boxing event, on the one side, you have these kinds of realities that under any and all circumstances, no country in the economies in which we live, fairly open, highly competitive, with firms that are winners needing to have access to the best people on a just-in-time basis. On the other side, we have vested interests that are getting more powerful rather than less powerful, that do call the shots, not just in Washington, but increasingly outside of Washington. So you have a rock and a hard pay, 
place, you have a champ versus another champ. It's going to be, in a sense, the main political event of the next, I don't know, 12 to 60 months, one to five years, which will set the stage, of course, for what it is that we're likely to be doing on immigration for the 20 years following that, because we have this slavish adherence, you know, to the past, you know, that somehow since government, since Congress, you know, has to have plenary control over the issue, that somehow this cannot be changed. I know it requires legislation and it will require the involvement of the Supreme Court, but if you're gonna stay in immigration, you're going to have to find a way to bypass the inability of the Congress to make any decisions on immigration except when it is at the precipice. And Congress can be at the precipice for a long, long time. On immigration, it's 11 years. You think I am almost falling over it, okay? Congress is right there, you know, 45 degrees and it's steady. Let's see whether in the next year or so that's gonna change. And I'll close by saying a few words about immigrant integration and about you know, the challenges and opportunities that social workers, uh, faculty of social work and the, the integration lab, is that what we call it, and the integration lab um, um, will be facing. I could be nice here and make everybody feel good. After all, I haven't been very nice so far. And tell you that everything is hanky-dory in the United States. We're doing great. You know, USCIS spends $20 million, $10 million in giving money for integration practices. That compares to a billion dollars that Canada puts into the system. Okay? Um, we have some language teaching. That compares the requirements of 800 hours of formal um, language teaching requirement of Germany. Um, we have no training systems to speak of, and that compares, you know, to very elaborated, highly elaborated, rather quite successful training systems for many of the European countries. And despite all that, if I were a teacher and I had to give a grade, whether it is to the Amer American integration effort or to the integration efforts of Switzerland, just to make sure that you're not left out, <laughs> or Germany or the Netherlands or, you know, Greece, <laughs> you can't give a grade. You have to give, you know, what's below an F, okay, whatever. <laughs> uh, you will probably have to give grades somewhere between sort of a C minus and an F plus to all of these places. Um, there are great efforts that are happening, experiments, some of which very successful. Westy knows about some of them, but they need to be scaled up. And I mean to be scaled up and up and up. And before you scale them up, you need to sort of make sure that people know about them. I'm a comparativist. My PhD is in comparative public policy. And I must tell you that, you know, I'm a stickler when it comes to borrowing ideas. Those of you here who are comparativists, the rest of you will get that intuitively. Realize that efforts fail or succeed in their own context. A simple thing like a visionary energetic whatever leader cannot be replicated from Boston to whatever, to Washington, D.C. The conditions of an extraordinarily successful activist like Eva and her team cannot really happen, you know, in Tennessee. We have a great immigrant coalition in Tennessee but it's an entirely different kettle of fish. 
So when you look from the 200 yards up, not the 40,000 feet up, you realize that there are lots of things that are interesting and, ch interesting and churning in the United States, but we're very, very far from earning something like a D or a D minus in terms of our integration. Furthermore, we borrow concepts from other contexts. You know, we talk about illegal immigration and the need to do something about it as somehow, as, it, it, as if it were the moral equivalent of the civil rights struggle. Something that I think we should object to because the civil rights struggle had an entirely different history. I know politicians are loose when it comes to borrowing sort of snippets of expressions, but the rest of us should be a hell of a lot more careful about using these things. And I am sure that faculty here understands. But if we're failing, the failure is actually much larger in other parts of the world. Ed Miliband, and you know who he is, Ed Miliband is the head of the Labour Party in England. He's given a speech today in which he will call, he will ask for people to build one nation with everyone in Britain knowing how to speak English. And that we should expect, the we here is we Brits, that the people who come here should either know or learn English. Ah, how abhorrent. Can you imagine if you were to say that everyone who comes to the United States should learn English, let alone if you were to say, as the Europeans do, many Europeans do, that if you want to come to the United States, you should learn English first. The Netherlands, Germany, Austria, the UK, now require an English exam before members can reunify with their families. Ah, horrible people those Europeans are, aren't they? But why are they coming up with such obviously extremist ideas? Because they have recognized how much they have failed in the past 40 or 50 years. And we must do everything to prevent the sense that it is failure that defines our integration programs. If there is one thing that we ought to put our collective shoulders against is asking of ourselves that we work as hard as we can, as smart as we can, to help people succeed. When immigrants succeed, the immigration system is freer to take chances, to change, to adapt. And when the immigration system succeeds, the immigration country succeeds. In other words, immigration and immigrant integration are two signs, two sides of the same coin. You can't do the other side of the coin well unless you do the first side of the coin well. And I think we have to really acknowledge that. That is the role that we must all play in the years ahead if we want to continue with an immigration system that by and large, by and large, is at the core of the way in which this country is organized, how it thinks of itself, how it grows, and how it can be again the leading country on earth where immigration and immigrants succeed. In order to help immigration and immigrants succeed, you have to do two things. You have to constantly change the formula on the basis of evidence of evaluation of what has happened before. And you have to have smart people like you here make it their business working within communities to make help 
people, all people. And inevitably, when you say all people who need help, you don't have to worry about immigrants. Close your eyes, and the room is going to be half full of immigrants. All people who need help in order to succeed in our society. So I said that I was going to say some hard, bad things, but I didn't. And I think it is healthy for my <laughs> well-being, you know, if I don't say much more than that. I'll finish by capsulizing some of the things that I would be thinking about if I were a faculty of social work at BC or somewhere else. But since you're a top 10 school in social work, I might as well say any serious school um, in social work. And you probably teach that in Social Work 101, but what the hell, I've never taken Social Work 101, so <laughs> no big deal. Understand the populations that you're working with. No one shoe fits all. It never has, it never works. You're going to be in the trenches, I suspect. Know who else is next to you in the trenches. And who is coming over the top of you, because just at the time that you think you've, you've done something smart, another shovel full of 500 people needing a slightly different set of services, having a slightly different set of needs, is going to be shoveled onto your head. So listening steals is what Westy said. That's a form of listening steals, learning all the time. In no other issue area is lifelong earning, learning more essential than working with large scale new populations like we bring in the United States. I would urge you to avoid politics. There's enough politics to go around. You know, leave the politics to the politicians. It doesn't mean that you don't talk about it, but I think if we need, if we're going to make progress on this issue, I think that, you know, the advocates and others, you know, probably need to do the politics. But don't shy away from telling the politicians how to think about the issue. The third one, and here it's almost an indictment uh, to people like me and you, steer away from ideologies. The worst thing that I've seen in my several decades, 40 years of sort of thinking and writing and seeing this is that we get too attracted and then, you know, too sort of comfortable with the ideologies of one sort or another. Multiculturalism. Never figured out. I just wrote a piece about six months ago. I have never figured out what that means. There's only one place that knows what that means, simply because it, multiculturalism is enshrined in the Constitution, and that is Canada, the only place on earth. And the reason that they did this is not because they wanted Indians and Pakistanis and everybody else to do whatever they needed to do with their culture. It's because the country was being split apart between French speakers and English speakers. Be careful about borrowing things that have an entirely different, in a sense, root, simply because it sounds nice, simply because we all like to live in what, you know, diverse multicultural societies, or because an academic, you know, wrote, you know, a pan, a love poem, an epic poem to diversity. He plays in academia. It doesn't play on the ground, and it plays even worse in politics. The next one is, please keep the interests of the broader society always, always in your mind. What we need as the country is changing is to always be mindful of the need for us to keep communities together. 
to make sure that regardless of who you are, newcomer, somebody who came you know, a generation ago, or somebody who moved from across the city to this community, that they're involved in a common project. The common project is building community. That's what social cohesion, you know, a word that the Europeans use that now I see all too loosely imported in the United States, that's what this is all about. This is about, in a sense, putting energy behind the centripetal powers of any system and trying to reduce the power of the centrifugal parts of any system. And the final thing is that, was that. So I apologize if I have offended some of you. I hope I haven't spoken down to any of you. Um, I thought that my role here would be to meet myself instead of trying to guess what it is that you folks may have wanted to hear. I thank you very much. Mics. We have time for about 15 minutes of question and answers, and uh, I had some things to say at the end of this, but I have to say, Dimitri, I might as well just tear up everything I was going to say based on all of the things that you've challenged. A wonderful job of, of challenging assumptions, and we'll give you time to ask questions. Ava, you want to break the ice? Dimitri, can you uh, share with us your thought on, thoughts on immigration reform, a fundamental change that we all hope it's going to happen? So what are your thoughts on the prospect as you know, way of policy, but also the politics, and if you can speak a little bit to the gang of eight? The, the gang of eight. <laughs> so, you know, we all live uh, in the same country. And... Some of us have tried to, um, to change uh, legislation in the United States uh, for about 11 years now. It all started back in the beginning of 2001, in fact, so it will be almost 13 years by the time that, uh, or 12 years, whatever it is, by the time of early next year, which is when everybody is going to get uh, more and more excited about immigration reform. I'll start from a simple fact. It was, you know, the footprints and the, of, of that were already in everything that I've said. We have to change our immigration system. It is an economic and a moral imperative. We have to do something about being more competitive in terms of immigration, bringing people that can help American companies um, release some of the entrepreneurial instincts of people who are already here, and perhaps, and here I'm not quite sure about it, of people who want to come and invest in the United States. And we have to do something about the people who are here out of any status, the 11 or 11 plus million people who are here illegally. I don't know what the it is. I don't know what the answer to that is. But I do know that we have to do something about it. If for no other reason, besides the fact that it's splitting the country apart, it has relegated, isolated, marginalized 11, 11 million people most of whom have been producing worker, you know, most of them have been good prodigious producers of value, economic value for the country, most of whom have families here, most of whom have made the United States their country, and most of whom tend to be just good people, just like you and I. I just don't know how we're going to do it. And 
there are going to be sort of two camps. There are going to be 15 or 30,000 camps. But if you wanted to sort of crystallize the two positions, on the one side, you have those people who are still perhaps stuck, are still arguing for something called comprehensive immigration reform, which is give a path to legal permanent status, which eventually bears permanent citizenship to as many of these 11 million people as can possibly qualify. And you need to make the standards a bit loose. This way, the vast majority of these people will qualify. On the other side, you have people, mostly Republicans, but I would imagine you know, that in every party, you know, there are going to be different views, who probably, as a result of the election, and as a result of the initiative that the president took last year with the DREAMers, the DACA, D-A-C-A kids, realize that they need to do something about most of the other ones. But what is something that they have in mind is legal, I'm sorry, permanent, temporary, non-immigrant status. I know there are many words. But it means that these people can stay here legally. They may or may not have to, every few years, come up with another piece of paper that says they can stay for another three or four years. Or it can be a grant that says you can stay here as long as you want. You get a work authorization. The family that you have here is the family that you have here. If you can change your circumstances because an employer sponsors you or whatever it is you may. But the rest of you will live here in a situation that will be more akin of what it was, let's say, in Germany up to the 19, late 19, mid 1997 when Germany changed the citizenship law. Or in France, you know, going back a while after, before that. Um, that basically allows people to stay and be legal and work and do all of the other things, but they are not going to ever be either permanent residents or citizens, nor will they all have what we call immigration benefits. So here are the two sides. You know, the White House and certainly the entire advocacy community will be pushing for the first thing. The Republicans and a lot of conservatives as well as all of the anti-immigration activists, the states that have passed legislation and all that, will want to be as close to that side. As it happens in everything in Washington, it's all about the compromise. So what is the compromise likely to be? I don't know, but I imagine that you're going to have probably a staged sort of legalization program. You start by putting everybody for as extended a period of time as the Republicans, as the Democrats are willing to buy into, in a permanent temporary status. And then I would imagine that you create a set of criteria, the Republicans' criteria, the Republicans will argue for more difficult criteria, the Democrats for softer criteria, through which, think of them as a screen, through which people who are in this permanent temporary status can shift on to permanent residence. The idea here is the reason that the Republicans need to do something is because they got completely sort of wiped out in the national elections. And that was part of the issue on which they got hurt. But they also know that if they allow people to get the right to vote eventually, or people to reunify with their families in the same way that traditionally family reunification works in the United States, they really will have to change the way that they speak about the issue, think about the issue, and somehow eventually be able to take credit for doing that and survive the next challenge two years later when they seek to be reelected. These are all very difficult things to do. So if there is a deal, and there is a big question mark ever as to whether we'll have a deal, if there is a deal, it's going to be somewhere between these two extremes. 
Um, I personally, you know, have lots of reservations as someone who uh, was the author of comprehensive immigration reform and all of the deals that it would imply. You know, I'm still attracted to the value of comprehensive for very simple reasons, because the whole is much larger than the sum of its parts. So if you do things separately, you get part of the way. But if you do things together, you have a whole that's much larger than the individual parts. But I'm also a big boy, and after 12, minute, 12 years of fa failure, I imagine that we're not gonna be able to accomplish that. So I suspect you're probably gonna have something along the lines that they discussed, although there will always be an element of people who say, no, 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 we don't want comprehensive. Let's take care of our high-tech industries. Let's take care of our agricultural industry. And that's going to be a separate fight that is taking place at the same time as you're trying to cut a deal. Because here is where you play a game of chicken, or there's a gun point, you point a gun to the temple of the other guy, and the other guy has a gun cocked and at your, on your own temple. It basically says that if you start peeling away special interests by giving them what they want, they will withdraw from the fight. If they withdraw from the fight, you get weaker. This is an one for all and all for one kind of a deal. You need to be as powerful as you possibly can in pushing for comprehensive. So what's likely to happen? We'll see how the political process moves forward. A simple thing. Fiscal cliff. If the president wins big, which then means that the Republicans lose big, some people may think that that gives more power to the president. I think that that, the effect on immigration reform, is exactly the opposite. The Republicans will basically feel that they're being pushed against the wall and they're not gonna work and cooperate on immigration. So, you know, it's just a whole series of imponderables. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that we kn all know that we have to do something about it and if we don't, we're in trouble. Um, sir, thank you so much. I have a question regarding education policy. You described this um, next trend of high-income country folks moving back to middle-income countries. A lot of them are young people. A lot of them um, are bilingual, and they are able to move that. You said you talked about Brazil. You talked about Morocco. I was talking. I was thinking if you could address how education policy, in the context of immigration, can be built into. Uh, can have the values of listening that you described and Wesley described embedded into these policies so that over time we can adapt to these changes. And if you can um, tell us if any of those um, developments have happened in other countries, uh, especially in Canada, um, and how that happens in a state and local level from adult education, um, teaching immigrants that are already here, to early education and K-12 education who are teaching both immigrant and native-born um, kids to be more globally competitive and to have that option to move back, to have that option to be more transnational. Thank you. You know, when I took on this assignment, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't feel that I was going to have to work as hard as this. <laughs> what happened to these soft balls? You know, come on. Say, say, Send one of those my way, would you please? <laughs> ah, all right. Um, this is really the $10 billion question. Um, because we are so, um, so within ourselves, you know, and we live in a country that thinks of itself as an exceptional country. You know, I, said to I say to people, you know, go to France you'll learn something about exceptionalism. Go to Japan, you'll learn something different about exceptionalism. We're not nearly as exceptional as we think. Uh, there is no education system 
around the developed world that is even beginning to come in close to understanding how to educate kids or adults who are of immigrant background. I just came back from a, a seminar that we sponsored in Madrid, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week. And we had, you know, ministers and deputy ministers from about eight or ten different European countries and Canada. And it's, again, for me, brought forth what it is that I've been hearing for 20 years now around the developed world, which is that the education systems that they have are sclerotic. Uh, they are run by people who have forgotten, you know, that's what politicians and analysts say, what their raison d'etre is, which is educate, 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 rather than protect privilege, protect privilege, protect privilege. And they're all struggling with how to address those two issues because you probably are an educator, so I, I apologize, I don't want to talk down to you. All of the brain research that we have now, as you know, is that an awful lot of, an awful lot of stuff happens in people's brains from the age of zero to three. The next possible intervention is three to eight. By the time that you reach eight years old, you've either lost or you won the game. So you can imagine how difficult it is for countries to actually implement that knowledge by forcing changes in education policy, by training teachers, by cutting deals with education est establishment, and by having universities focus their teacher training on these kinds of early intervention things. That's why no one is doing particularly well in that regard. And in the United States, coming at the other end, which is adult education, you know, we probably were not doing nearly as bad in adult education as, you know, many people may have thought until, of course, we started to take apart the entire infrastructure of the adult education system in the last three or four years. You know, the, if you're from California, any of you, I think that you would have been very proud of the adult education, the two-year colleges that you've had in California. They're practically completely defunded. Germany, that has the most organized system of adult education, is still trying to figure out how to insert immigrants into an adult, educa an adult education system that is based on several prior steps that you need to have in order to be able to get to that system, and how immigrants and people of immigrant descent can actually meet all these prior requirements in order for them to learn and be able to partic participate in an organized economy. So these are very difficult issues. They go beyond language. The debates now is essentially how do you walk, you know, from training to education, of course, all starting with English, um, with language training. And how do you move forward in order for these populations to contribute what they want to contribute in the economy of our societies? It's a disqualifier. So if you have a, a really good system, you're excluding people because they don't qualify to really enter the system. If you have a lousy system, you can't really help anyone. So one of the many areas in which we need to really think hard is indeed the education and training system and the crosswalk between these two systems.